It's Friday Feedback Friday, the feedbackiest day of the week. Just hands. Wow, you can see how kind of bent and broken my hands are. That's actually an old injury from playing basketball. That one here. The repetitive stress is why I can't open my hands more than that. But that bent finger, that's from basketball back in the day. In the old ghetto hoops. They don't make them this way anymore, possibly for this reason. But they used to be on poles. And I... It was my mistake. I was guarding under the net. You're not supposed to do that. But I kind of came around and boom, and I clang. I still remember. And my finger came right out of the joint. And, and me being me back then, it was like, pop it back in, keep playing. And because of that, it's bent for the rest of my life. Right there. My Spock is bendy. Uh, but yeah, I digress. It is Feedback Friday. And uh, look, I'm getting this shot more down. I am experimenting with many things right now. I probably should have only changed one thing. Uh, <laughs> get it next time. Oh, maybe I should bring the microphone closer. There we go. But yeah, I put this picture that my friend gave me like years ago and I had no place to put it, but I put it in the background to try to lighten it up and it seems to be working. Look, I have a nose and contours. And then I am experimenting with the BB cream. I have never used a BB cream before. I don't know where the B and the B came from. Those are usually bra sizes for me. But yeah, I want something less heavy. Because I have freckles and I think it looks kind of stupid when there's like this mask of makeup. And oh look, there's freckles all over the arms and all over everywhere else, but none on the face. I think it looks bad. On to your feedback for the week. And I'm thinking this tinted moisturizer is actually too yellow. Curse you BB cream! Uh, the, uh, Momo Monday video, I always love how you guys are mature about these things. Um, one comment in, in, in particular I thought was really apt was the comment from this commenter that people want to see gender as a set of boxes rather than bell curves. To both extremes of the pol political spectrum, everybody needs to fit exactly into a box that describes their gender. To the extreme right, there are two boxes and you must modify your behavior to fit one. To, for the very extreme right, it must be the one they say you fit in or you're a freak. To the extreme left, there are potentially infinite number of boxes and you must sort through their laundry list of boxes until you find the tiny niche that exactly describes you or make one up and add it to the list. I think it's healthier to view masculinity and femininity as bell curves. There are statistical norms and outliers and you can fit on the curve while being an outlier right now we seem to be in the middle of a social argument between one group of extremists who insist that outliers should be punished or made to conform and another group of extremists who insist that there should not even be such a thing as norms i don't see why it's so hard for people to simply acknowledge the existence of norms and outliers a statistical fact without trying to punish shame or change the outliers just for being outliers why should the rest of us have to choose between accepting tyranny and rejecting reality? And I'm sure you'll get a lot of, because I, I have said something very similar and, and got some very interesting answers about the whole free speech being taken away and... But I agree with this commenter in principle that, yeah, why can't it be that simple? Some people said, I have nice feet. Thank you very much. Some, uh, another commenter talk, uh, talked about the alternate, the kind of the other side of the spectrum to my response, uh, my experiences regarding, you know, gender nonconforming behavior as a kid in that you know, young boys who like My Little Pony or prefer reading to sports, prefer school choir, drama group, that sort of stuff. And the, you know, the traditional reaction is, please, God, don't let the kid be a fag. And the, the commenter's words, not mine. Okay, just being clear. I'm just quoting. Uh, but I, I think that's actually the word people use in this, this context. And that's true. And I find that strange because... My Little Pony, like the modern My Little Pony, is a really good show for anybody. And it's just so odd that there are elements of the show to like other than it being about ponies that are all voiced by girls, right? It's funny. It's dynamic. A lot happens. It's brightly colored. The characters are broad. There's really no reason 
for a boy not to like My Little Pony. I think Powerpuff Girls was one of those shows, too, that it it defied that. And I'd love to see more of that. I um, There's... Uh, uh, you know, the, the Thursday video with with Troy talked about, I think it was a Thursday video. I'm so discombobulated about that interview now. I'm going to leave the bulk of the comments on that one to next Friday, just because I'm pre-recording this because of the, uh, the Ed the Sock Live launch that happened last night. So I'm making sure all this is taken care of in advance so I have not had a chance to look over the comments from, from Thursdays. Troy Levitt piece, and so I figure I'll just leave it mostly to the end. I have one small comment, but that is it. I remember a time where nobody thought gaming was for boys. Nobody thought gaming was for girls. Gaming was just for people who want to play games. I miss arcades in that regard. I think it would be cool to have a social experiment to kind of set up that kind of arcade idea of like a console lounge and people could just sit down and try the games and actually see what people gravitate towards when they're not dropping 80 bucks on very little information and a buttload of identity marketing. Blue sky, my interest, you know, maybe if, if the future project is super well, I can incorporate that into it. Who knows? But I want to move on to the, um, uh, you know, the, the Tuesday video about the twerking hijab young woman thing and how I connected it to gaming and, and my uh, response to Majid Nawaz. And apparently I'm saying his name right. Yay! Growing up with all those people from Pakistan and Afghanistan paid off. Huzzah! Uh, <laughs> but um, the comments on that, I almost chickened out of that video. There are certain videos just like, ah, do it, do it, do it. That's me pushing buttons in a panic because for some odd reason I forget how to touch type. Ah, get it done before you freak out. Cause tough ground, tough ground, right? But so far, so good. No agenda driven group has gotten a hold of it and freaked out over it. So, uh, yay. I'm a big believer in having faith in your audience as a YouTuber, and you guys proved me right yet again. There, there were some strange comments. I can't tell if they were angry or goofing around. They made so little sense that I, I, there are words there. There was one comment who, I think this is worthy of address. I tried to talk about this when I was writing the cosplay dossier column on The Escapist, and it was the most controversial thing I ever wrote, I still don't understand why. There are some things that just make people go crazy and, like, lose their minds. And it was somebody who self-identifies as a fat chick. And... She says, I'm assuming she, because fat chick. But as a fat chick, I find the dress even more limiting. We don't get conventionally to be sexy in those who do get called not sluts, but just ugly. We get defeminized, and in a world where people still base female value on their looks, we end up as not even female. If women are seen as lessers, a fat girl is non-existent as a human. And this is an element of media criticism that gets people very upset because it's interpreted as forced to pretend you like things that you don't actually find attractive. And then some people take it to the point where, well, nobody finds fat chicks attractive. That's just, oh, can you imagine somebody frank inviting that? Just that, me saying that, well, but Trust me, I have done enough work with the adult industry. There are plenty of guys that find big, beautiful women to be their preference. It is not across the board that men like skinny chicks. And I first discovered this when I was doing Ed and Red's Night Party. 
uh, when I was still a producer, not not on air, when I was interviewing and auditioning and hiring the the female talent. And, uh, you know, I actually listened to men and what they actually found attractive. And I didn't just copy what other shows were doing. What I learned from that experience is that guys are more likely to look for something they like about someone as opposed to the couple of things they don't like. You know, if a lady's got giant boobs, they don't care if she's got a 24 inch waist, they're looking at the boobs. And that's objectifying. Well, no, it's actually looking at a human being as, you know, sexualized, but not necessarily sexually objectified. Men have a far greater spectrum of what they find attractive than the media likes to make you believe. And it is true that larger women are practically invisible as whole people in media. And I mean, this was one of my issues with the Ghostbusters movie. And I didn't get into it because there was so much of a poop storm going on at the time, but I really didn't like the way they deliberately de-glammed the cast. You know, they were, they were all, you know, that one woman who was constantly with everything. And then, you know, Leslie Jones is yelling all the time and it was all just, oh, we're going to be the, a lot of the humor was in kind of a gauche girl power thing. And while yes, it's allowing for women to be in a movie as leads and that's great. It's not the celebration, it's not expanding the definition of beauty, and, and that's what we very much need. And women like, you know, Sofia Vergara do a lot more for that. And people are like, what are you talking about? Sofia Vergara is like perfect. And if you look at her, especially as she's gotten older, she has not gone out of her way to just stay the same proportion she was when she was 25. She's aged gracefully but she's not going crazy trying to have the same body she did back then. And people still think she's super sexy. And, and because glamour, I mean, don't forget the origin of the word glamour is actually a deceptive spell. It's a camouflage, right? And it's very true. The media is all about altering perspective. It's all about making things look prettier than they actually are or less attractive or uglier than they actually are. It pulls things towards the extremes. And it's important to remember that, that it is a business of glamour, but representation still matters. TV's better at it than, um, than film is so far. Um, because film is a lot more afraid of putting any bit of market share off. They have to get so many people into those theaters to make their money back on blockbusters. And every once in a while a movie comes along like My Big Fat Greek Wedding or Bridesmaids or something like that. And there's a, a you know, a plus size person in it. Yeah, same plus size person in this case. But, you know, it makes a ton of money and everybody goes, oh, it's solved. And of course it's not. Because that's not a blockbuster. They still are having issues where there'll be medical shows and every single doctor looks like an actor. And I think this commenter put it best that it's one thing to be insulted. It's another thing to not exist at all. And that's my concern with the way the so-called diversity mandate is being handled in media right now, where it's all about mass shaming. It's making people less um, confident in taking risks. And that's bad for obvious reasons. And people prejudge things 
And then there's not enough discussion as to why decisions were made. The Doctor Strange film was a classic example of that. People freaked out because the Tilda Swinton character in that film was originally an Asian guy. Um, obviously, Tilda Swinton is not an Asian guy. And the I think it was the director of the film, I'm blanking on who it is right now, said that that was an instance of how do you want to fail? Because there are no female characters other than the girlfriend in Doctor Strange, and the girlfriend disappears. So the ongoing property, you needed a female character, you needed to put them somewhere. But the other problem is that the original character was Tibetan, which is a non-starter for China. And guess where a lot of money comes from for Hollywood blockbusters now? I just liked a lot. I said I wasn't going to talk about the Troy Levitt stuff um, immediately. There was just one line I want to kind of tip my cap to. Uh, this person who, who is another person like me who self-identifies a feminist, self-identifies a gamer, uh, they find that they don't have to, you know, it's not as relevant being a feminist as often as it is relevant being the gamer. But she said, if, a ga if gamer as an identity is dead, feminist as an identity is dead and fossilized. And that is a very valid point with all of the stones thrown at feminism nowadays. Should feminists really be going after any other identity? Well put, good line, well done. Now I want to take the remaining five minutes and the half hour to talk as best I can about something I really don't know enough about. Multiple commenters, both on YouTube and on Twitter and on Patreon, asked me to talk about both the Colin Moriarty and the John Tron things that happened this week. And my immediate reaction, and, and you know, hear me out here, don't, don't just knee jerk over my immediate reaction. My immediate reaction is why am I going to take up my airtime because a, a couple of guys I don't know said something stupid. It's a correlation, not a causation, that Colin Moriarty left kind of funny right after this and i i do accept his explanation that this was not what caused it when people are in a bad place professionally they tend to make choices that they wouldn't make if they were in happier times and i don't think the tweet he put up was funny i don't care what anybody says it's an attitude from the 1950s. He used the a day without a woman hashtag as a ah, peace and quiet. And then, you know, the John Tron thing is less serious because it's just the John Tron thing. I don't know. Like he made some comments about race and immigration responding to Steve King's comments. And I'm not going to repeat them because sigh. But obviously I don't agree with what he's saying. And I don't have to. And this is where I feel it's worth weighing in. Guys like Colin Moriarty, guys like John Tron, they're not running for public office. They're not in charge of the rules that govern the rest of us. So I can think their comments are, you know, the word gross, and I hate using that word, gross. It sounds so grade school, but... I can, I can disagree strongly. I can think they're, uh, you know, I can even think certain comments are hateful. I, I definitely think they are offensive. But I say some things that are deliberately offensive sometimes too. Free speech. 
And because they're not running for office, because they have no real control over the rest of us, I do not understand the lynch mobs that form when people say idiotic stuff like this. I think Colin Moriarty knew what he was doing. He knew he was making a deliberately offensive comment. And there's a place for that, as other people have rightly pointed out. Twitter is not that place, because Twitter is the place where nuance goes to die. I think it's different with, with Colin Moriarty than John Tron. Because Colin Moriarty's comment was intended to be a joke. It was an offensive joke. But it was intended to be a joke. And I am more forgiving of that because of the long history of offensive comedy that I have been a part of. Well, you know, Ed and Red's Night Party was a comedy show. And we did offensive comedy. You know, we had shows where people were throwing chocolate penises at each other. Actual chocolate, not actual penis. And, and we did a lot of things to push the envelope to see if the envelope deserved to be pushed, if that makes any sense. The whole idea is it was on at 11.30 on a Friday night. People knew what the show was going in. If you don't like it, don't watch. We're not offended. It's not for everybody. Twitter's a little different because it can hit you when you, you know, least expect it. And I rarely actually read my Twitter timeline because people just, yeah, there's, there's some things you can't unsee about people. We're still learning how to exist in a social media driven world. We're still getting used to knowing a lot more about each other. And in this regard, it's a lot like the industrial revolution where people came in from the country and started living in very close quarters in cities. And because of that, privacy reduced significantly. We're, we're going through another sea change in that regard where we are still getting used to knowing a lot more about each other. And I've been saying this for at least five years now, that there's going to be an adjustment. And I think that people need, you know, the ability to have a bad day, to say stupid things, to, and I say this as somebody who's been, you know, on the receiving end of more than one of these, these Twitter freakouts. And that's why I'm very careful judging these things from just a tweet. A tweet cannot see into somebody's soul. If somebody has an ongoing um, pattern of these things, then that's different. But one tweet, you can't tell what a person's about based on one tweet. Getting over to the larger question of what do we do about comments like that. I get that people are well-meaning. We're like, we have to stand up for the women's. And, you know, it's up there with making racist statements on a Black History Month tag. It's not the smartest thing to do. You're going to, well, you're not guaranteed to cause outrage because nothing's guaranteed on Twitter, but it's one of those things where you have to be prepared to take that if you're going to do that on Twitter. There are some things I have said that I know are going to rustle Jimmy's and I do it anyway because either I think it's important enough or I'm just so sick to death of people being professionally offended by everything. The JonTron stuff is more complicated because he had a greater opportunity to um, walk back and he didn't. Um, th this is an example of 
people are either going to forgive him for these comments or they're not. And he bears ultimate responsibility for that. But I, I don't think anybody has to do anything to whip that up. This is between him and his subscribers. The, the rest of us... Free speech principles make this kind of easy. He has the right to say offensive things. There's no reason to jump on any bandwagon if you don't watch his content. If you're a viewer of his and you find this crosses a line and you can't enjoy his content anymore, that's an absolutely personal decision. The question is, what about the people who hear this don't agree with it, but are still going to continue to watch his content. And I think that's a valid choice as well. There are some people who are able to separate less than good opinions someone may have and them being entertaining. No matter how my natural inclination to go, this is bad and shouldn't exist, tugs at me. And that, oh, that was bad, eh? I shouldn't, that's a different kind of tug. Oops. Um, but that is my gut reaction when I hear these things, personally. But that's why principles matter. That's why ethics matter. That's why morals matter. Because I can stop myself and say, I don't watch his stuff. It's none of my business. There's no point in me. I know who he is, obviously. I am aware of him, but I, I don't have the time to watch a bunch of YouTubers and I don't tend to watch regularly gaming YouTubers because I don't wanna copy what they're doing. And so this is not a debate for me to have. This is a debate between him and his subscribers. And just like, to me, first and foremost, the people I'm going to listen to are the people that, that, um, that support me on Patreon. Because they're the people that have decided my content is worth them putting down money every month. And so when one of them has an issue with something, I listen. But this is the market, and this is the reality, and, and this is the grown-up element of believing in free speech that it is giving other people the space to say things that I don't like and I don't agree with and I even think are borderline bad examples. They are bad examples of behavior. I won't say harmful because we know how I feel about that. Very high bar, can't prove it. But being a believer in free speech is also being a believer in the idea that eventually people are smart enough to get it right. And so far, in most cases, that has served me quite well. You know, there are people I've had clashes with and eventually the truth comes out. If it's a deal breaker for you, don't consume their content anymore. If it's not, Keep going. There's plenty of YouTube viewers. There's, there's plenty of tastes. There's plenty of people to go around. And again, I'm separating what I personally think about it, my own opinions, from what I think should happen next. Because you guys know how I feel about these things. Why the hell do you care about my opinion? My opinion should not be what you use to make your opinion, right? I'll offer facts. I'll offer evidence. I'll offer consider this. And if we're sitting down in a bar and we're having drinks and it's just my personal opinion, then yes, I will give you that. But I don't like this thing of I'm going to try to persuade you to think something I think. That's not my role. And I think there's too much of that. 
I think there's too many people guilting and shaming and frightening people into changing their minds just to go along to get along. But, uh, question. Do we need a question this week? What do you think about the new setup? Better? Yeah? You like? Okay, sorry guys. Have a good weekend. See you again on Momo Monday.